Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome, a uh, very warm welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to this time of worship that we have together in the Lord's providence. It's so good to see you all, boys and girls. I hope that uh, you can see me, and I'm so thankful because now I can see you, which is a great blessing to me as we worship together this morning. And you know, uh, doing this isn't just kind of a neat thing to do. Oh, let's have a worship service like a picnic in the park. Obviously, it's in light of the Lord's providence that we're meeting like this today, and uh, we're thankful, and we should be mindful of many things. I think meeting today like this should uh, remind us how easily we can take things for granted, how easily we can take uh, just meeting together for granted, having a building to meet, and take that for granted, and uh, we shouldn't do that. Uh, we should be very thankful and consciously thankful for all of the provisions that the Lord gives us as his, as his church. It also should be a reminder to us of uh, church history, uh, because there were many times, and there still are times in the history of the church, uh, where people have met outdoors like this, boys and girls. You know, in the book of Hebrews, it says that they met in caves and holes in the ground. The world was not worthy of them. And we know that in our own denominational history, that uh, Christians met out in the valleys, in the hills, the moors of Scotland to worship God. And as they did that, they were listening uh, for the hoofbeats of the king's soldiers, which at any moment could come over the top of the hill with their swords drawn. Uh, we should remember the history of the church and persecuted Christians today who have nowhere uh, to meet but in hiding and in secret. And as we gather together uh, this morning here, let's, let's call to mind all those things and the blessings that God gives us as his people. Uh, just a few announcements, of course. As the sun moves, if you need more shade, don't, don't worry about that. Just do what you need to do and move there. Uh, there is a, a, a bathroom facility, washroom facility there uh, for you if that's needed as well. And uh, let's do respect the guidelines, the uh, restrictions that have been laid out for us. We do want to take that seriously as we love our neighbor as ourselves. And we remember still that uh, ongoing uh, concern for the, for the pandemic. Well, as we come together in worship, let's spend a few moments quietly and silently in prayer as we ask God the Holy Spirit to help us and prepare us as we come into worship, let us pray. Our great and glorious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we bow before you in worship as the Creator, as we worship here and look around. Lord, even in a fallen world, we see so much of your wisdom and power displayed in the things that you've made. And you are the God who sustains all things by the word of your power. In Christ, all things hold together. Uh, Lord, we know that in you we live and move and have our being. And everything that we need for life is a gift from your hand in your mercy and grace. A Father, especially we gather together this morning as your people, the church. And as we meet in this way, Lord, we were reminded that the church is not the building in which we meet. We are living stones. We are being built into a spiritual house upon the foundation of the prophets and the apostles with Christ himself as our chief cornerstone. So no matter where we would gather, Lord, uh, we are the church, and where two or three are gathered, you are there with them, and we are thankful for that promise. 
We're thankful for the blessing of the Holy Spirit in our lives, who is the counselor that Christ has sent, the ascended, victorious Lord Jesus Christ, that he is our teacher and comforter and guide and counselor, and that he empowers and enables us to live the Christian life, having given us the new birth, the birth from above. We are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, even resurrection power, to live the Christian life. And this morning, we pray to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Father, as we come together this morning, we pray that you would help us to meditate upon the great theme of your love for your people in the gospel. You are the eternal triune God who eternally dwells in that triune fellowship of love. And your love has been demonstrated to your people in that while we were still sinners and enemies because of our sin, Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. Father, we say the words, we can memorize the words, but we pray that you would impress this great truth and gospel reality upon our hearts and minds and souls this morning. And that your love for us, Father, would be the pulse beat of our Christian life. And that it would be a blessing to us and that it would be so evident to others that the world would know that you are a great saving God of love. And most of all, Lord, that you would be glorified in all of your glorious attributes, your holiness and your justice and your wrath, but also, Lord, the unsearchable riches of your grace and mercy and kindness to us, your love for us, and toward us in Jesus Christ. Father, bless the ministry of your word this morning. And we pray, Father, that your name would be lifted up, that Christ would be exalted, that we'd be filled with the Holy Spirit this morning as we worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship is from Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Our opening psalm is Psalm 103, the B selection. It will be played over the speakers. If you have your Psalters or a Bible open, uh, you could follow along. Uh, according to the guidelines, uh, even outdoors like this in a church service, uh, singing uh, is not being encouraged. Uh, but you can make melody in your hearts to the Lord. And if you just can't help it, you can hum very loudly. But meditate on the words. Meditate on the words as you hear them. Uh, the, the Psalms are not just for our entertainment. We're to meditate on the truth, to glorify God, and to edify our souls. Psalm 103, the B selection. Bless the Lord, my soul, my whole heart, ever bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, my soul, forget not all his blessings to proclaim. He forgives all your transgressions, your diseases all he heals. He redeems you from destruction, and with you he kindly deals. He with love and mercy crowns 
fills you, satisfies your years with good, so that you will, like the eagle, with youth's vigor be renewed. He shall intervene with justice for all those who are oppressed. For their sake the Lord takes action, governing in righteousness. He revealed his deeds to Israel and made Moses know his path. Lord of grace and full of pity, rich in love and slow to wrath, he will not continue striving nor be angry constantly. Has not dealt with us as sinners, punishing iniquity. For as high as are the heavens, far above the earth below, just as great to those who fear him is the steadfast love his for as east from west is distant, he has put away our sin. Like the pity of a father has the Lord's compassion been. So we come before the Lord. In a prayer of confession and repentance, I'm going to read from uh, John chapter 14, beginning at verse 23. John 14, uh, verses 23 and 24. This is what God's word says. Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, as we come before you this morning in worship, uh, Lord, many of us, I would pray, all of us, even from the youngest, would profess to be Christians, that we love the Lord Jesus. Uh, but Father, uh, we know that uh, simply saying something doesn't mean it's true. Uh, Judas could betray the Lord Jesus with a kiss. Father, we pray that you would help us to examine our hearts and our lives, examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. And here Jesus puts his finger on that examination uh, very simply, uh, very piercingly, when he says that if we love him, we are those who obey his teaching that we believe what the Bible teaches to be true if we love Jesus. That we desire and strive to keep the law as it's summarized in the Ten Commandments because we love Jesus. That we want more and more to love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength because we love Jesus. And we have it as a goal of our lives to love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves because we love Jesus most.
Father, we pray that we would hear these words of Christ with real spiritual ears. And we know that if we truly hear them, not one of us could stand here before you in our own lives, in the lives that we have lived over the past week or even this morning and say that this we have done perfectly. And so how thankful we are, Lord God, that the gospel simply doesn't simply or only declare the love that we show toward you and the lives that are consistent with that love. The gospel first declares your love towards sinners. And that where sin abounds, your grace and love have abounded much more. This is love. Not that we loved you, but that you loved us and sent your Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And Father, as we confess our sin, as we're convicted by it and confess it and know your forgiveness according to the promise of your word, Lord, surely this increases the love that we have for Jesus, the love that we have for you, our Father, the love that we have for the Spirit. And so, Lord, we are all the more eager to obey the teaching of the one we love. Father, we pray that this would be uh, the experience of our lives and that our children and our children's children would know your saving love toward them in Christ and be those who love Jesus, who can say so simply but so profoundly in the words of the psalmist, I love the Lord. In his name we pray, amen. By way of response, we turn to Psalm 51, and we uh, listen to the C selection, Psalm 51, C, And again, let's give our attention to this part of God's Word. 51c. God be merciful to me on your love I rest my plea by your vast abounding grace my transgressions all Our Old Testament reading this morning is from uh, Hosea, Hosea chapter 11, 
uh, reading verses 1 through 11. Hosea chapter 11. We'll begin at the first verse as we give our attention to this part of God's holy and pure word. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. They sacrificed to the Baals, and they burned incense to images. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. But they did not realize it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love. I lifted the yoke from their neck and bent down to feed them. Will they not return to Egypt and will not Assyria rule over them because they refuse to repent? Swords will flash in their cities, will destroy the bars of their gates and put an end to their plans. My people are determined to turn from me. Even if they call to the Most High, he will by no means exalt them. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over? Israel, how can I treat you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboim? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger, nor will I turn and devastate Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One among you. I will not come in wrath. They will follow the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, his children will come trembling from the west. They will come trembling like birds from Egypt, like doves from Assyria. I will settle them in their homes, declares the Lord. And we ought to note that as the Lord declares his unfathomable, merciful love and kindness to a sinful people here in this chapter, he does that in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know from the New Testament that this part of the Old Testament is applied specifically to Jesus. Boys and girls, do you remember when Herod tried to kill the infant Lord Jesus Christ, and Joseph was warned in a dream to flee with Jesus and his mother Mary to Egypt and then to return, that that scripture, out of Egypt I have called my son, is applied to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in him and only in him that the mercy and saving love of God is declared and displayed and applied to the people of God. Let's turn in our Psalters to Psalm 107, the A selection, 107A. Oh, thank the Lord, for He is good. His love endures eternally. So let the Lord's redeemed declare The ones he from their foes set free He gathered them and brought them forth From east and west, from south and north They wandered through the wilderness No city found in which to dwell their hunger and their thirst increased, their souls within grew faint as well. 
So to the Lord they cried, hard pressed, he rescued them from their distress. Then to a city forth they went, he led them on a pathway straight. So let them to the Lord give thanks for all his love and wonders great. The thirsty soul he satisfies, with good the hungry he supplies. Give thanks to the Lord, his love endures eternally. Let's turn in God's word together this morning again to Paul's letter to the Ephesians. We continue to look with God's help at the end of chapter 3, this pivotal prayer in the letter, uh, the prayer of the Apostle Paul for the Christians there in the ancient city of Ephesus, but uh, part of the holy word of God for the church of Jesus Christ in every generation. And so we turn to Ephesians chapter 3, reading again verses 14 through 19. And considering, especially this morning, uh, verse 18 and the beginning of verse 19. Let's pause and ask for the Lord's help as we come under the hearing of his holy word. Let us pray. Our holy and loving Father in heaven. You have shown your love to us in Jesus Christ and you have shown your love to us in giving us the word of Christ, the holy scriptures, the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments, the sufficient, perfect, inerrant, infallible word of God. And we pray, Lord, that we would love the word because we love the God of the Word, the Christ of the Word, and the Spirit of the Word. And we pray, Father, that uh, the love of Christ being poured out into our hearts by your Word and Spirit would overflow from our lives into greater love for you, our triune God, and greater love for our neighbor, even Lord, for those who are our enemies, that we would love as you love, you make the rain fall and the sun shine and the just and the unjust, and you call us to love even our enemies and to pray for them so that we would be children of our Father in heaven and resemble him. And we pray, Father, that as we do that, many by the working of your Spirit would have their eyes and ears and hearts and minds opened to the incomparable love of Christ and that they would be brought by the saving power of your sovereign grace and spirit to bow their knees in humble, loving worship and praise and service of such a great and loving Savior as Jesus is. We pray that, Lord, in humble reliance upon the work of the Holy Spirit. And we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at the 14th verse, as we again give our attention to the inerrant and infallible word of God. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp How wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, 
that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. That's as far as we'll read this morning in this part of God's holy word. May he bless it to our lives. Beloved, in our age of information, we are constantly bombarded with messages telling us what we need to know. I'm sure that you've seen all the headlines and the articles to that effect as I have. What you need to know about COVID-19. What you need to know about the U.S.-Canada-Mexico trade agreement. What you need to know about Bitcoin. What you need to know about dietary supplements. And on and on and on it goes. Now, it is probably helpful to know something about lots of those things. Ignorance may be bliss, but it is rarely safe or helpful or productive. But here this morning, as we continue considering Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3, we see something that we all need to know. In this part of Holy Scripture, we have been noting Paul's priorities in prayer. And this must be, then, what God wants our priorities to be as his children in prayer. Because even in this personal prayer of the Apostle Paul, these are not just the words of a man, but the very word of God to the church in every generation. And we need to ask ourselves as we've been going through this prayer and continue to work through it, what do we find when we compare our priorities to Paul's priorities? What do we hear when we listen to Paul's prayer and then listen to our prayers? What do we learn about the triune God of our salvation as we learn the various aspects of this apostolic prayer. Well, as we come to verse 18 in the beginning of verse 19, we can summarize all of those questions as we see here that we need to know the love of God in Christ. There are lots of things that the Bible teaches us about God and about salvation. And none of those things are unimportant or unnecessary. But the fact remains that as Paul follows his overview of salvation in chapters 1 and 2 of this letter in the beginning of chapter 3, and as he prays in response to all that he has taught, he focuses in on this particular subject, the love of God in Christ. Friends, the love of God is proclaimed wherever the gospel is proclaimed. This is how God loved the world, John 3, 16. He gave his only begotten Son. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, Nothing therefore should give greater joy to all God's people than to meditate upon this love of Christ. In the Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 4, we read, He has brought me to his banquet hall, and his banner over me is love. Friends, what will bring the most comfort and assurance to you as a Christian? 
the love of God in Christ. Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What will help you trust in the forgiveness of your sins? Psalm 51 verse 1. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. What will help you to persevere as a believer under the greatest hardships and trials of your faith? The love of God in Christ. Romans 8, 39. Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What will be the best help for you in the battle against remaining sin in your life? To conquer idols. And lusts and worldliness and love of self, it will be the love of God in Christ. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me. And gave himself for me. What will be the greatest encouragement for you to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ in your life? The love of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.14 For Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. When the well-known missionary Hudson Taylor was the director of the China Inland Mission, he would be the one who would usually interview candidates for the mission field. And once he met with a group of applicants and he questioned them as to their motivations for service. Why do you wish to go as a foreign missionary, he asked one person. I want to go because Christ has commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Another replied, I want to go because millions are perishing without Christ. And others gave different reasons. And then Hudson Taylor replied, All of these motives, however good, will fail you. In times of testings and trials and tribulations and possible death, there is but one motive that will sustain you in the trial and the testing, namely, the love of Christ. And if that is the lone motive, that is able to sustain foreign missionaries. This is the motive that will sustain you, brother and sister in Christ, in your testings and in your trials. This one thing, the love of God in Christ. Friends, that the Apostle Paul prays this way for these Christians is a way of saying to them, I want you to know how much you are loved. I want you to know as a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ how much you are loved. Do you know how much you're loved? Often, even in human terms, we don't appreciate how much we're loved. You children here, even you young people, teenagers, 
a child or young person really, really has little idea, I would say in general, of how much they are loved until they hold their own child in their arms. Or think of you, your experience in the church. Do you know how much you're loved? We often really don't realize perhaps how much and how deeply you are loved until you're diagnosed perhaps with cancer and you start a blog on the internet and you're overwhelmed with how many people write comments on the site expressing their heartfelt love and ongoing support in prayer. Do you know how much you're loved? But that's not always the case for everyone, you might say. Not everyone is loved in that way. And you're probably right. The story has been told of the terrible days during the London bombing blitz at the beginning of World War II. And after one bombing raid, an eight-year-old boy was found sobbing amidst the smoking ruins of a burnt-out building. The boy was asked where his father was. He is overseas in the service, the boy answered. What about your mother or brothers or sisters? I don't have any, the boy replied. They've all been killed. Any relatives, grandparents, anybody? No one, said the boy. The rescuer stooped down near to the child's face and asked, Son, who are you? And sobbing convulsively, the boy said with a quivering voice, Mr. I ain't nobody's nothing. That can happen in this world. But both for those who have known lots of love or little love in human terms, what a blessing and hope that in the gospel a supernatural love is revealed greater than the greatest of human loves could ever be. The love of God in Christ. Child of God, do you know how much you're loved? Are you aware of this love? Are you growing in your understanding and appreciation of it? Or is it something that you possess as a Christian, but it is not a vibrantly practical part of your life, as it should be. And I include myself in that question. I think many of us live along the lines of an article I read last week. The title of the article was, Strapped for Cash, How to Uncover Unclaimed Money That Belongs to You. In the article, I read the Canada Revenue Agency is sitting on about $1 billion from checks for tax refunds and benefits that taxpayers have never cashed. The Bank of Canada said it paid out $8.5 million last year to Canadians who submitted claims. And the article said it has plenty more to dole out. The bank reports it was sitting on $888 million in unclaimed balances at the close of 2019. A $1.9 million inheritance 
is currently sitting idle in British Columbia, waiting for the next of kin to make the claim. Are you living the Christian life like that? Do you know, child of God, how much you're loved? Is it, it is something, beloved, to be known, we see in our passage. That you may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. It is something to be known, to grasp, other translations say to comprehend. The word means to lay hold of. It's used in 1 Corinthians 9.24. Run like a runner, an athlete. Run in such a way that you may obtain the prize. To lay hold of it. Paul says in Philippians 3, Not that I have already attained all this, obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. And here in our text, this grasping means to lay hold of something in your thinking. As some translate it, Paul is referring here to a firm mental grasp of the love of Christ. You see, this is a rational knowledge of the love of Christ that is basic to the Christian life. One writer says there is no intellectual element in infatuation. If love does not make you think, it is not love. Love enjoys dwelling upon, looking at, dissecting, analyzing, and considering. The apostle is praying here that saints everywhere would begin to study the love of Christ. You can study mathematics, you can study biology, you can study uh, medicine, you can study auto mechanics, you can study accounting, you can study all kinds of things. But how much of your life is spent studying the love of Christ? The fact is you will never see an answer to this prayer in your life without being a serious student of the Bible. Because it is in the word of God that you will learn about the love of God in Christ. It is in the Bible that you learn who our triune God is. It is in the Bible that you learn who you really are. And it is there that you learn what he has done for you. And all three of those things teach you about the love of God in Christ. I pray that you would grasp it, Paul says. And then he adds, and to know the love of Christ. This is a different word. It's a more personal word, a more experiential word. A word that begins in the intellect and then spills over into the emotions, and into the will, and becomes an intimate, experienced reality. Casey Hill is an ultramarathon runner. He recently said before a race called the Leadville 100, that's a hundred mile long race through the mountains of Colorado, he said everyone knows about the Leadville 100, Everyone in his circles anyway. But I want to know what it takes to finish it. And you see the difference. You understand what he's saying. You can know the distance. You can know the route. You can know the elevation gains and losses. You can know the checkpoints, the terrain, the obstacles. You can know everything about the race but you wouldn't really know the race until you had run it yourself. 
Paul prays that you may know the love of Christ. If you are ever to watch your life and doctrine closely, you must consider the love of Christ closely. And as we look carefully at this prayer, what do you need to know about knowing the love of Christ? We can boil it down to just one thing. It is beyond you. It is beyond you. The love of Christ is beyond you in three ways. First, Paul, in Paul's prayer, we see that the love of Christ is beyond us because it is beyond our strength. It is beyond our strength. Great endeavors require great strength. And there is no greater endeavor in a human life than to know the love of Christ. When you climb a mountain, your strength or your lack of it will be shown in the first five minutes. And you'll be sitting beside the trail. You've ditched your backpack and you're gasping for air. You see, Paul doesn't just pray for these Christians to grasp or to know the love of Christ. He prays, if you look carefully at your Bibles, he prays that they would be strengthened to grasp the love of Christ. Empowered to understand the love of Christ. Beloved, we need to remember the gospel is all about grace from first to last. It is not something we do or we can achieve on our own. No part of it from beginning to end. Even understanding and knowing the love of Christ is a gift which God keeps, in which God keeps on giving strength. Unless we're born again, we don't see or grasp or know the love of Christ. We just won't. A person can look at the cross, even the cross, and apart from God's grace, see at best a pitiful martyr for a lost cause and at worst a dangerous religious fanatic who needed to be eliminated. Apart from the grace of God, you'd never see the love of Christ. Robert Murray McShane wrote the poem, Jehovah Tzidkenu, The Lord Our Righteousness. And it's an autobiographical poem in which he says, before the grace of God came into his life, Jehovah said, Cain, Christ, the Lord, our righteousness, meant nothing to me. Nothing. Friend, what do you see when you see the cross of Christ? Do you see what Wesley sang? Amazing love. How can it be? That thou, my God, shouldst die for me. We need the working of the Spirit in the new birth to even begin to comprehend and grasp the love of God in Christ. But that need for spiritual strength continues. We need strength for the study of the Word of God for attention to the reading and preaching of God's word, for the disciplines of the Christian life, for the true understanding of scripture. You can't do that on your own. Apart from Christ, you can do nothing. And apart from the Spirit strengthening you, it's futile. In our own weakness, we will never grasp and know the love of Christ. But Paul prays because this is a gospel possibility by the spirit strengthening your apprehension and appreciation of the love of christ will continue to grow knowing the love of christ is beyond your strength but not the spirit's strength secondly the love of christ is beyond you in another way it is beyond you individually it is beyond you individually Look at what Paul prays, that you may have power 
together with all the saints. Together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Now, why would the Apostle Paul add that in this prayer? Together with all the saints. We're so used to thinking individualistically, even in the Christian life. I need to know Christ. I need to know the love of Christ. The Spirit needs to strengthen me that I would grasp and know the love of Christ. As personal, as, in, as important as that is, Paul doesn't leave it at that individual level. He says that you, together with all the saints, would grasp and know. Why does Paul add this? Why focus here, as he's speaking of the love of Christ and knowing the love of Christ, why focus on the church and not the individual? Well, it may be that he is simply saying and emphasizing this is what we all need. No one can get on in the Christian life without grasping the love of Christ. No one. You can't say, well, I specialize in the sovereignty of God. And I specialize uh, in the wrath of God. And I specialize in this or that. and, And that's all of my focus. Know that you, together with all the saints, it's for each one of you to grasp and to know the love of Christ. I'm too young, together with all the saints. I'm too old, together with all the saints. I have no education, together with all the saints. The church is where we together all need to grasp and know the love of Christ. We will never grasp or know the love of Christ as we should if we are individualistic. It is good to think about the love of Christ, isn't it, toward all the saints. Christ loves all kinds of people, young and old, male and female, Black and white, simple and sophisticated, blue collar, white collar, rich, poor, from a Christian home or from a crack house. All the saints. Oh, friends, our love can be so selective, even in the church. Do you grasp the love of Christ together with all the saints? And it's also good to hear from others about their grasp of the love of Christ. We grow in this together. Psalm 66, 16, Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. Every congregation has people from all kinds of situations and backgrounds who are experiencing so many different circumstances in God's providence but each one seeing the love of Christ toward them in their lives and sharing it with others in the church. Grasping the love of Christ is a corporate activity as much as it is a corporate reality. The love of Christ is beyond your strength. It is beyond you as an individual. And last, the love of Christ is beyond you Because it is beyond our comprehending. It is beyond our comprehending. And this certainly is the main point here in these verses. Paul prays that we would grasp something beyond grasping. That we would know something beyond knowing. To comprehend what is really incomprehensible. Literally, the beginning of verse 19 reads, to know the beyond knowing love of Christ. One writer says, to know the unknowable is a paradox at the heart of all true Christianity. There is a basic principle in theology. The finite cannot comprehend the infinite. As one writer said, we can see where the ocean begins, but not where it ends. Boys and girls, have you ever stood at the edge of a great lake 
maybe Lake Ontario, or even the ocean. You can see where that body of water begins. But as much as you strain your eyes, you cannot see where it ends. So too the love of Christ. In the gospel, we are dealing with infinite realities. A Scottish man named Thomas Charles eventually became a Christian minister, but he was initially trained as a mathematician. He wanted to be a professor of mathematics, but something changed the course of his life. God did. He explained himself once to a friend by asking his friend, What, sir, is the object of mathematics? And then he answered his own question. It is the study of magnitude and the proportion of magnitude. But I myself had forgotten two magnitudes. I did not think about the shortness of time in this life. And I recklessly did not think of the greatness of eternity. In Christianity and biblical religion, we deal with magnitudes. And here, the great magnitude is the love of Christ. Paul is praying for Christians to know the magnitude of Christ's love. In verse 18, he simply says, to grasp the breadth and length and height and depth. Four dimensions seen as one immense, vast, unfathomable whole. I understand now they have 4D movies, somehow. I think they add extra effects. Not just 3D, 4D. Well, here's the original 4D. It's the love of Christ. The breadth and length and height and depth. Even the love of Christ. In the book of Job, we read in chapter 11... Verse 7, can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens above. What can you do? They are deeper than the deeps below. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. So too the love of Christ. I remember as a boy being captivated when I first either read it or heard it in a worship service. The biblical language of forgiveness. And I remember pondering it and pondering it. How mind-stretching it was as a boy. But it wasn't just my young, immature brain that was not up to the challenge. I'm even more humbled now. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, How high is that, children? So great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west. How I pondered those words. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. Many have mused on the four dimensions of Christ's love. In its breath saving an innumerable multitude of saved souls. Can you count the stars of the sky or the sands of the seashore? Its length from everlasting to everlasting. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I've loved you with an everlasting love. I've drawn you with unfailing kindness. And if his love is everlasting, it means it's every day too. The heights of the love of Christ that would find us seated with Christ in heavenly realms, Ephesians 2. And most staggering of all, the depths to which the love of Christ went for us as he went for us and our salvation. From the heights of divine glory, not counting equality with God, something to be grasped, he emptied himself. Remaining what he always was, he became something he was not. Born of a woman, born under the law, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But down yet further than the incarnation, no place to lay his head, a man of sorrows and acquainted with suffering. Down, down, down he went to the mocking, the beating, 
the spitting, the betraying, down, down, down to the cross and to the forsakenness of his own father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The love of Christ from the heights of heaven to the depths of hell. The beyond knowing love of Christ. A thousand sermons and a thousand lifetimes will never fully know the breadth and length and height and depth of the love of Christ. Beloved, Christ has loved, loves, and will love you more than you will ever know. He loves you more than the world loves you. The world that some of you think loves you, and so you're loving the world back in return. The world is like Ammon, who woos Tamer. The world woos you, and then when it has you, it hates you. Then Ammon hated her with an intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he loved her. And Ammon said to her, get up and get out. Christ loves you more than the devil pretends to love you and have your interests at heart. Are you listening to his seductive lies? Would you commit spiritual adultery with him? For the lips of the adulterous woman drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as gall, sharp as a double-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lead straight to the grave. And friend, Christ loves you, child of God, more than you love yourself. Whether you sinfully regard or sinfully disregard yourself, the love of Christ overwhelms sin in any form. And listen to this, friends. Christ loves you more than the clouds and storms of providence often seem to indicate. Something happens in your life, and you know how the devil whispers in your ear, does Christ love me in this? A godly minister was once very ill, and his friends came to comfort him. They called to mind his good deeds and how he had always cared for the lambs of Christ's flock. And one of them prayed, Lord, you know how he loves you. Ah, my friends, said the sick minister, do not say that. When Mary and Martha went to Jesus, their message was not, Lord, he who loves you is sick, but he whom you love is sick. It is not my imperfect love to him that gives me comfort, but his perfect love to me. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. And we can say the same for the love of Christ. Do you grasp it? Do you know it? Friends, there is really just one practical application in this part of Paul's prayer. Pray. 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 Pray for yourself. Pray for your children. Pray for your loved ones. Pray for your neighbors. In all your other prayers for other things, pray that you together with all the saints would grasp and know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. In Psalm 63, the psalmist says, Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. Let us pray. Oh, Father, how thankful we are for your word which is perfectly sufficient, which is sufficiently clear, which is inerrant and infallible, which comes to us with all authority and which teaches us everything we need to know in the Christian life and reveals to us what we could never know 
on our own, even things that are beyond our knowing. Lord, may we meditate on this part of Paul's prayer. And so in answer to this prayer, being strengthened by your spirit, we pray that we too would grow in our grasp and knowledge of the love of Christ. How life-changing it will be. And how we will glorify you and praise you all the more for your love in Christ, which is better than life. Because your love in Christ is stronger than the grave and more powerful than death. Lord, we pray that you would enable us to pray and that you would answer this prayer increasingly in our lives and in our congregation and in your church in the world, we pray. Father, even as we pray for our congregation, we pray for those who, who perhaps are, are doubting your love, who are rebelling against your love. Whatever it may be, Lord, you know your people, Jesus, you know your sheep. May we return, Father, and increase in our knowledge of your love for us. We pray for Greg Alexander. We pray for Ann DeWall, Elaine Bennett, and others, Lord, who are sick presently or sick chronically or facing things, debilities of many kinds, Lord, perhaps until the resurrection in their bodies or unto their deaths in their minds and souls. Father, we pray for mercy upon your sheep. We pray, Father, that you would bless uh, our efforts to meet together, whether that's over the live stream on the internet or here together this morning. Lord, a lot goes into that. And we're thankful. It's not ideal, but we're thankful. We pray, Lord, that your blessing would still be upon it. We pray for wisdom for those who are working toward our own place of worship and ministry. That that would come about in your time and in your way. That we'd have wisdom from above and peace in the church. And that you use it for uh, the coming of your kingdom and the building up of the church of Christ in our part of your world. Father, we do pray that you would bless us in our places of work, in our homes, but also outside of the home, that the love of Christ toward us would be very evident in our lives as we love you and love those around us. And Father, we pray for the witness of your church, that the glorious love of Christ in the cross and in the resurrection would be proclaimed and that many would come to know this love that surpasses knowledge and worship and serve you. Lord, there are many false religions in the world that know nothing of gospel love. May we be quick to proclaim it. And Father, we pray for those Christians in the world who are being persecuted for loving Jesus. May your love toward them be so evident in their lives that it would sustain and support them and enable them to stand firm even if you should choose to the point of shedding their blood. The love of Christ who first shed his blood in a unique way for us is the only thing that can empower and enable your people to stand firm through even the greatest trials. Father, we pray all these things, again, in the name of the one who loved us and gave himself for us, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Just remind you as well that in terms of offerings and giving to the Lord's work, that that can be done as it's laid out in the bulletin for you, and not to uh, forget that part of our worship toward uh, the Lord, but our closing psalm together this morning is psalm 89 the a selection psalm 89 a let's open our psalters and give our attention to this part of god's word as we hear again about the loving kindness of our god 89 a
The loving kindness of the Lord forever I will sing. Your faithfulness to every age my mouth in song shall bring. I will proclaim your steadfast love forever will endure. Your faithfulness in heaven high you will establish sure. I've made a covenant with him who is my chosen one. To David, who my servant is, what I have sworn be done. Your seed I will establish firm, forever to endure. And I through every coming age will make your throne secure. The praises of your wonders, Lord, the heavens shall express. In counsel of the holy ones, your faithfulness confess. For who in heaven with the Lord could ever be compared among the ranks of angels great who has his likeness shared? Before we receive God's blessing, his benediction upon his people, please do keep in mind uh, the instructions that were uh, sent out earlier about uh, the way to uh, be dismissed here this morning. I know that it's a great temptation. Aaron, do you want to make some announcements about that afterward? Uh, those are important things as well. And also for uh, this evening, Lord willing, we'll go back to uh, the uh, live stream of the evening worship service, Lord willing, at 6 p.m. Well, with the love of God in Christ, I pray ringing in our ears and in our hearts, Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, receive God's blessing, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit of God be with you all now and forevermore. Amen and amen.